So you've enrolled in your workplace pension. Great. But are you making the most of it? Usually by leaving your pension as it was given to you by default means you could be missing out on a greater income for the future. So I'm going to walk you through five ways to fix your workplace pension. So without further ado, I'm Kozan from Financial Madness, helping you be better with your money. So as you may know, a workplace pension is a great vehicle to help save for your retirement. Every month, you and your employer contribute to your workplace pension, and this money is used to invest in a variety of stocks and bonds in the hopes that your investments will provide a good enough return to replace your income for retirement. But what you may not know is that you can make some adjustments to your workplace pension to ensure it is working the most efficiently because simply leaving it as it was given to you usually means you are missing out on even greater returns. So with that being said, let's go through the five adjustments you can do. Please note though, however, this is only applicable for defined contribution pensions and not defined benefits. So the first step is to actually check what your pension is currently investing in. Your employer should have given you details on how to log on onto your pension account. So you should be able to view this information quite easily. Otherwise, if you're not sure, be sure to contact your employer or your pension provider to get further information on this. Normally, pensions are invested in funds and you should have the option to choose which fund you want your pension to invest in. Funds are usually given a risk rating in a form of a number, and this indicates if the fund has been assessed as a low risk investment, balanced or high risk. Low risk indicates that your investments are in safer assets, which usually means you are likely to make smaller returns, with high risks meaning you're investing in more riskier and more volatile assets, but this could mean larger rewards. And then obviously balanced is somewhere in between. You'll probably find that your workplace pension defaults to a fund that is rated balanced, which you may be happy with. But if you are someone who is young, this can be terrible in terms of maximizing your pension's potential growth. But then again, this is all down to you. Please assess what your risk appetite is and make adjustments accordingly. I myself, I'm 28 with a good few years from retirement. So I usually go for a high risk approach, which usually means investing in stocks rather than bonds so I usually put myself in a high risk category. Now, the amount of investment options you can choose from greatly differs depending on your provider. Now, this is actually one of the largest drawbacks in a workplace pension, as it is typical for the investment options to be very limited. It's not always the case though. For my example, my provider has actually done some major work to increase the amount of investment options, and I can actually choose from over 300 different funds. But by contrast, looking at my partner's one, he only has six options to choose from. So it can differ greatly depending on the provider. But anyway, let me show you my actual example. Just wanna quickly say that during the recording of this video, the screen recording that I was actually doing while I was talking through it uh, actually failed somehow. Uh, I only noticed this a few days after during edit. So the value of these funds have changed ever so slightly. So you'll notice some of the percentage points and numbers that I actually say versus what you'll see on screen is going to be slightly different. And that is the reason why. So yeah, hopefully it's not too confusing, um, but yeah, the numbers are more or less very similar. So my pension actually defaulted me to investing in a fund that was level five. So just one notch above three and four, which we would consider a risk of balanced. The fund is called Standard Life Managed Pension Fund, which if I look at the fact sheet is heavily invested in UK equity funds and about 20% is invested in bonds. I actually decided to move from them on July 2019, which was about three years ago. But what if I decided to stay with them? Let's look at what their cumulative growth performance was in the last three years. So if we look at their stats, we can see that they've actually grown over the last three years by 27.04%, which isn't so bad. Now, if you look at the new fund that I actually moved to, which is actually called the Standard Life Overseas Tracker Pension Fund, which is rated at a level six. And if we look at their fact sheet, we can see it's 100% equity investments with the majority of it held in US stocks. Now, if we look at their cumulative growth within the last three years, we can actually see it's actually grown by 60.87%, which is more than double the growth than if I just left my pension on its default setting. You will also notice that the fund is also cheaper, which will bring me to my next point. But while I have this on the screen, you can see that my new fund actually costs 0.235%, whereas my old one costs 0.253%. By the way, this is your reminder to subscribe. So this is a nice segue into my second point, fees. Always look at fees. Usually fees nowadays are relatively cheap, but it is worth having a look at what your fund is currently being charged as they can range quite vastly. You want to try and go as low as possible without compromising too much on the pension fund that you believe is right for you. 
Now I'm going to show you my example because with my workplace pension, the fees are actually discounted. So I can actually show you how much I would be paying per year without the discount versus what it is like with the discount. So for the full picture, I roughly have about £40,000 saved in my workplace pension currently. Now the fund that I have now chosen has a standard fee of 1.005%, which is just crazy high. This would actually cost me £403.91 per year to have this fund. And remember that the fee is based on the size of your pot. So assuming we keep contributing, that means your pension pot will increase in size, that means the costs can also increase as well. So it's really important that we keep these costs as low as possible. Now, as you can see with my workplace, I thankfully get a 0.77% discount, which brings my charge to a rate of 0.235%. But as you can still see, even with a charge of 0.77%, I would be paying £309.38 per year, which is still really, really high. Now, looking at my actual rate of 0.235%, which isn't too bad, but it's still slightly higher than the norm, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. So this fund actually cost me £94.43 per year. So even with a small percentage, you can see that the fees can be quite drastic. It's also important to understand how your provider collects these fees too. So they usually collect their payments from your pension pot. So the higher the fees, the more capital is actually being taken from your pension, and therefore your pot will not be able to grow as effectively compared to if you had chosen a fund with lower fees. So don't be fooled by the fact that a 1% fee sounds cheap. It really, really isn't. So the next tip is to check how much your employer is contributing. So let's get one thing straight. The biggest benefit of your workplace pension is that not only are you contributing to your pot, but your employer also has to contribute to the scheme as well. And this benefit is unmatched anywhere else. By law, your employer has to be contributing at least 3% of your salary to the pension pot. So you can think of this effectively as free money. Because unless you're enrolled in your workplace pension, you cannot get access to this 3% contribution from your employer. So if you're thinking, oh, if I just leave my pension scheme, I can get a boost of 3% from my employer who normally puts this into my pension and they'll put it in my take home pay. It doesn't actually work like that. This is money that you can only get access to if you are enrolled in your workplace pension. So with that being said, did you know that your employer can sometimes contribute more than 3%? If your employer does offer this, what you want to make sure you are doing is that you are doing whatever it takes to get the most amount of money from them, because again, it is free money. For example, it is quite common that employers will do matching contribution schemes. So they'll say, if you increase your contributions to say 7%, we'll also increase our contributions to 7%. If you do 8%, we'll also do 8% as well. And there is usually a limit on how far they will go and you want to make sure that you are meeting them at this limit. That way you have more capital in your pension fund and therefore it is likely to compound far more effectively and therefore reap greater rewards in the future. Now my next step is for those that are on higher rate or additional rate incomes. So when it comes to contributing to your pension, the government actually rewards you in the form of tax relief, which basically means for any money that you give to your pension, this money should not be subject to any income tax. So keeping things simple, if you are a basic rate tax holder, you are charged a rate of 20% on income tax. And let's say you decide to contribute £100 to your pension. Now, because this money shouldn't be taxed, the government will give back 20% to you. So that £100 you contributed actually costs you £80 as the government gave you £20 back through tax relief. I break this down in more detail in my pension tax relief video. So check out that video if you do want to learn more. Now this tax relief is done automatically for everyone on the basic rate tax ban. So if you fall into those categories, you don't really have to worry about it. But for those on higher or additional rate incomes, you can actually claim on more tax relief because you pay 40% or 45% taxes on a proportion of your income. In most cases, the extra tax relief is not done automatically. So you will have to do extra steps to claim this. Again, I go into more detail on how to make those claims in my tax relief video, so be sure to check out that if you want to learn more. So by making sure you are claiming on all of the tax relief you're allowed to, you're ensuring that all the contributions you make 
cost you the least amount of money in your take home pay. Now the final tip is merging old pensions and SIPs. Now I put these two together just to give you something to think about. So bear with me on this. So tackling the first part, merging pensions. So it is very likely that you have had more than one job in your working career. And therefore it is very likely you have had a workplace pension for each company you have worked for. So that means you may have several pension pots. Now, not only will each of these pension pots have a limited amount of funds in them, so they won't be making as much of a return, but they are also accruing their own annual fees as well, which will be hurting you massively. So what you want to be doing is consolidating all of these old workplace pensions under one roof. Now, before doing this, I would check with each previous pension pot that they don't come with any additional benefits. And specifically, they're not a final salary pension, as it may be worth keeping these open. But otherwise, for the most part, you'll probably want to merge them. And you can do this in either of the following two ways. So the first one being is that you can merge them into your current workplace pension. Pension. Therefore, you are only going to be charged in one fund and that fund will have a lot more capital and thus more likely to generate larger returns. Or the second option is that you can merge it into another private pension, but outside of your workplace one, and you can put it into something called a SIP. Now, there are several providers that offer a SIP pension and they act just like a workplace pension. You invest your money in stocks and bonds and you are still entitled to tax relief every time you contribute to one. However, in some respects, a SIP can be a better pension pot than your workplace pension as they tend to offer more variety in their investment options and SIPs are typically a lot cheaper than the workplace pensions too. So if you are unhappy with your workplace pension offerings, then going via the SIP route might actually be more beneficial. So you might now be thinking, well, why don't I just put everything into a SIP and stop contributing to my workplace pensions if SIPs are so much better? Which is a good question and I have a very simple answer for you. And that is that your workplace pension offers free cash that you get from your employer. Remember, this is money you cannot get from any other means. So my suggestion is to keep investing in your workplace pension to maximize that free cash. And if you think a SIP offers you better options, then for any old contributions, be sure to consolidate them under a SIP roof instead. I'm currently working on a SIP video and I will tag it here once it is ready so you can learn more about them. Cool, so those are the five ways to fix your workplace pension. Have I missed anything? Please be sure to let me know in the comments section down below. I'm always interested to hear from you all. And as always, if you did find this video incredibly useful, I would appreciate if you smash that like button. That does wonders for the growth of my YouTube channel. And remember, I release a video every single week. So if you wanna keep up to date with those, hit the subscribe button too. See you later, bye.